This is an emergency transmission. Citizens of the world, please, make no mistake. The zombie apocalypse is near. Will you cower and hide, or join us and fight? We are the Zombified. So stay on point, and watch your six. This house is possessed. I have always been quite adventurous, so it stands to reason that when I had spare time alone, I would hop in my car and go exploring. I especially liked finding old abandoned homes, and there are a lot of them in Colorado. My husband hated the fact that I would do this completely alone, and he was always afraid that I would get into trouble. When I saw a no trespassing sign, it was an invitation, so it's no surprise that I would often be where I wasn't supposed to be. One day, while out driving old country roads, that I happened upon an old abandoned farmhouse. So I pulled into the driveway. There was no garage or carport, so my car was right in plain sight. This old red brick farmhouse was all boarded up. But around the side of the house, there was an opening where one of the boards had fallen off. So I scrambled on up and crawled through. I found myself in a front bedroom. Of course, it was rather dark, but there were cracks in the boards that led in just enough light that you could easily maneuver throughout the house without too much difficulty. Imagine my surprise to find... Everything still in the house, untouched. Near as I could tell, it had been empty since sometime in the 60s. So had been sitting in this condition for at least 20 years. I found this very strange that no kids had gotten inside to party, nor any evidence of a homeless person, especially since this house could easily be seen from the I-25, a major highway that goes through the heart of Denver and there was an exit within walking distance to this house. Denver had a very large homeless population, just like all the big cities have. The living room had all the furniture, lamps, tables, and the bedrooms had armoires and iron beds, everything left in the kitchen, along with home canned goods, spices, dishes, everything still there. In the bedroom where I entered, there was a portable toilet, and I wondered if someone had been sick. I got a feeling that that was the case. I spent hours in there just looking through pictures and postcards of the family that had lived there. There was a ton of Catholic paraphernalia too, you know, crucifixes on the walls, rosary beads, and the like. It was fascinating to me, and I was trying to figure out why this family had left the house this way. And I was also surprised when I came out to find out how many hours had passed, but I chalked it up to being involved and losing track of time. I've never worn a watch, so it wasn't hard to believe that this could happen. The place also wasn't too far from my house, so I would go there as often as I could and wander the grounds, investigating the sheds and the outhouses. The root cellar under the house was loaded with old canned goods and rotted root vegetables. The smell, of course, after all this time was non-existent, so really it wasn't unpleasant. I kept wondering what had happened here. I did not know that the family that owned this home lived just around the corner on the same street. How I found out was they caught me there and ran me off. I watched them as they left and saw where they went. Now, when I would go back, I'd look to see if they were home before I'd go in. So week after week, month after month, I would go back. There was so much to explore. Time after time, they would catch me there again and again and always run me off. I always wondered why they never called the police on me, but they never did. I think they knew I was being haunted, although I was unaware of this at the time. Later on, after I had been exploring for a number of months, I began to find myself there with no recollection 
as to how or when I had got there. But every time I went in, hours and hours would go by. And every time I came out, I was always surprised at how much time had passed. I would think I was in there for two hours, but would find at least six hours had passed, and it was dusk. It would begin to get dark, and I would have to leave because, of course, there was no electricity. I was completely taken over and got it into my mind that I wanted to buy this house. So I talked to my husband about it, never revealing to him that I had been going there. I kept it a secret from everyone, even my best friend. I did some research and tried to find out everything I could about it. I did find out that it was built in 1910, but could get no other information about it. I even tried to talk to the people that owned the house, but they would never tell me anything at all. They would just tell me to leave again. I never damaged anything and left everything as it was. I never took anything from that house until one day. I was drawn to an old green woven clothes hamper in very good condition. And since I needed one at home, I took it. No one would miss it, right? Now I had made a connection. Bad move. Soon after this, I had a dream. Or was it a dream? A figure in a dark hooded cloak approached me and said, Can I come in to you and finish living out the rest of my life? I replied, If I do, then when can I live out the rest of my life? And the figure disappeared, and I woke up. Creepy, huh? I do believe that the hamper was a catalyst for this event. I should have not taken anything. Thou shall not steal. There's always a reason for his commandments. The next time I went to the house, it had been completely demolished. The house and all of the outbuildings were gone. There was absolutely no trace that anything was ever there. Not a brick, not a board, not even the foundation. The root cellar had been filled in completely. I was devastated and wondered how and why they did this. The house was safe and could have been sold. I had been going there two and three times a week, so I don't know how this was accomplished so quickly. I wonder if the dream came after the destruction, but I had not known what they had done, and the hamper made it possible for the spirit to come to me. I kept that hamper for a number of years and was always haunted by whatever had happened there. As long as I held on to it, I could not release myself from the spirit that inhabited the house. Although I never had any more dreams, I finally did rid myself of it, though, because I knew as long as I hung on to it, I'd never be free. I do not remember how I disposed of it, but it wasn't until then that I was finally released. But this had gone on for years. I'm very much more careful now when and where I go and will stand outside and take the time to size up the spirit or spirits connected to these old places before entering. Please, if you're out exploring and you find a place like this, do not take anything as you don't know what you are bringing home. And if you have taken anything from a house like this, Get rid of it now. Peter Pan is not what most people think he is, or I guess I should say, would be, but honestly, he's real. I have not only seen him, but also felt him. I met Peter Pan when I was about 11 years old. It had been a hard day with my family. I was playing outside with my siblings. They were both older than me. Sue was my 15-year-old sister, and James was my 14-year-old brother. Of course, like most siblings their age, they didn't want to be around me. They had dates and homework, and James had drugs and other stupid shit like that too. But they were forced to entertain me. I don't specifically remember what we were doing, but I do remember noticing an animal on the road. My siblings noticed me looking at it, and James told me to go see what it was. My brother always made me nervous, so I walked up to it and realized it was a dead cat. 
From my view, I could see that the cat was missing at least one eye where a nest of maggots was beginning to form, and I could see various bald spots and scratches that seeped blood. It was also missing a leg and half of its tail. James told me to touch it. My sister argued that it was disgusting and could be infected. James smacked her hard. Naturally, she cried out in pain and he shouted at her. Stay the F out of it! Then he got right in my face and told me quietly that he wanted me to pick it up. I was hesitant, but after watching what he did to Sue, I had no choice. I reached around it and found that it still had an eye in the other socket, but it was also missing half of its chest and all kinds of gross traumatic stuff inside of it from days of lying on the street. Next was even worse, and I wish I would have risked my brother hurting me, because he told me it put it on our neighbor's lawn. She was an old widow, although I don't remember her name. She's long dead by now. James told me to put the cat on the porch, ring the doorbell, and run away as fast as I could. So I did. I set the cat down on the porch and wiped my bloody hands on my jeans. I looked at the doorbell. I probably wouldn't have done it if my brother hadn't shouted, Hurry up! Terrified of him, I rang the doorbell and dashed behind another neighbor's bush. The widow opened the door and shrieked at the disgusting sight of the cat, and I looked for my siblings, who had both apparently run off. Obviously, my hiding spot was not very hidden, and I was easily spotted. She started shouting at me, and I ran home. That night, I was scolded by both my parents while my other siblings were let off with a warning. James blamed me, saying I doorbell ditched with the dead cat even after he said to stay away from it, and because of the red mark on Sue's cheek, he even said that I slapped my sister when she tried to intervene. My sister, out of fear of my brother, agreed. All of my attempts to defend myself were reflected, and I went to bed early. I sat there waiting to get called down for dinner until I heard the table being set, and waited to be called down to eat but never was. I sat in anger and solace until midnight. That's when he showed up. Of course, my room was very dark, but because my family was so poor, I had holes in my curtains, and light always peeked in through. I could see shadows coming through, dissipating what little light was left. That's when I saw a hand slowly open the curtain, and a boy about my age jump through. It was Peter Pan, Peter Pan was not exactly what I expected. I could barely make out what he looked like in the dirt, and the moonlight behind him wasn't much help. Even though I couldn't see him, I could tell he was looking at me. I could feel it. He asked, It's been a hard day, hasn't it? Who are you? I replied. I did not feel afraid. Rather, I felt comforted by the stranger's voice. My name is Peter Pan, he answered. And what if I told you that you could go someplace where you would never, never have to worry about any of that sort of thing again? I couldn't help it. I wanted to say yes, even though I know I shouldn't. I said, You want me to go to... to... To Neverland, Peter finished. Despite what had happened that day, I was still reluctant to leave. Despite the fact that my sister didn't do much to help me, I knew deep down she wanted to. She was just as helpless as I was in the situation. As if reading my thoughts, Peter added, Don't worry about your sister. We'll bring her in soon. But first we have to prepare. After that, there was nothing to consider. Peter Pan stretched out his hand so that I could take it and said, The reason birds can fly and we can't is simply because they have perfect faith. For to have faith is to have wings. And just like that, I flew. Flying was amazing, like a dream you never want to wake up from. We went higher and higher until we were just below the clouds and we could see the lights coming from the buildings. It was beautiful. The best part of this was that I wasn't afraid of falling, not even for a moment. Considering I was hundreds of feet in the air, far too high for anyone to see, especially in the dark, you might imagine that I would have been terrified, but I wasn't. Instead, I was overjoyed, bursting with a fearless excitement. It was pure joy. After flying around the buildings, 
we took our leave and headed over the ocean, which took several minutes to traverse. The further we got from land, the darker the water became. I assumed it was part of the lights until I saw Neverland, which appeared as an abyss in the sea, even darker than the sky. There were no stars at all, and no clouds. Everything was pitch black. This was the first time I became nervous since I had met Peter Pan. When we landed, the island seemed a little lighter, but not by much. Then I realized something. I hadn't seen Tinkerbell at all, so I asked, Hey, Peter Pan, where is Tinkerbell? Peter Pan looked at me, and although it was too dark to see his face, I could tell he was smiling. And it was very sinister. Now I was no longer nervous. I was afraid. After staring for several seconds, he turned around and walked into what appeared to be a cave. There was no light in the cave, and the passage was lengthy. Every time we stopped, I could feel breathing on my neck. But after a couple of hours, I saw light. We walked into a new room, and the light from the fire in the middle was, bi was blinding and hot. Sit down, Peter commanded, and give yourself some time for your eyes to adjust to the light. In no mood to argue, I did as I was told, and even before my eyes had a chance to adjust, Peter turned to me and asked, Do you believe in fairies? If you believe, clap your hands. I, I, again, did, I, I again did as I was told, and instantaneously my vision returned to me. In the newfound light, and to my utter shock and dismay, I beheld handiwork of a monster, a horror beyond my wildest imagination, a pile of corpses, many of which belonged to people who appeared to be just a few years older than me, lay before me, all of them horribly mutilated. I turned around to see that more than teenagers had been harmed. I saw cages filled with fairies. Some of them were dead, but most were alive and in pain. Some were missing limbs, legs, or arms. In some cases, even their wings had been torn off. Others had been impaled with sewing needles, repeatedly. Once again I turned around to see Peter Pan. It was like I was truly seeing him for the first time, as he truly looked. Peter was the worst sight of all. His skin was paper pale. His eyes were completely black except for the pupils, which were red. He was bleeding from both his eyes and his gaping mouth, and he was smiling, sincerely smiling. His hair was caked with a mixture of both fresh and dry blood. His clothes were a dark green type of cloth and were stitched together by human hair. Instead of sleeves, he had leaves over his shoulders and his pants, which were hemmed just below the knee, were in tatters. To top it all off, he wore cloth shoes. In terror I ran, but soon realized there was no way out. Not even with the entrance through which I had arrived was accessible. And all the while, Peter just stood there, smiling, and he said to me, I know I've made a mess, but you see, they grow up so fast. This way... They'll stay young forever, just like me, and they will always be in Neverland. I sat with my head tucked between my legs. Peter grabbed me Peter grabbed me by the hair, lifted me up, and said, I have a gift for you. I know you were worried about leaving your sister behind, so I brought her here with us. Then, with his fist still wound around a fistful of my hair, he forced me to look at a sad figure chained down to one side of the room. It was my sister Sue. She looked awful. Peter continued. You see, she's just a little too old to be in Neverland, but you didn't but you needn't be sorry for her. She was the type who enjoys growing up, and in the end, she aged of her own free will. Then Peter Pan chained me across from her so that I could watch as he worked on her. Before long, we were both in agony, sobbing uncontrollably. Peter grabbed Sue by the hair and tore out a handful. She screamed in anguish. 
He tossed the hair to the ground in front of me. He put his hands on either side of Sue's head and shushed her, then dug his thumbs into her eyes as she shrieked. In moments, she was blind and blood was pouring out of her sockets. I can't have you sitting down, Peter chided her. You need to feel the excitement with me. He drew a knife and stabbed her in the shoulder, then twisted the blade. He then pulled a hook from the dark ceiling, sticking it through the fresh wound. Then he slowly cut her stomach with the knife, deep enough to ensure that she would bleed out. Then he worked his way up so he could watch himself cut her without blood getting in the way. He worked all the way up to her chest, at which point he stopped and said, Sue, you don't have to cry. I bet I have the solution to your tears. Then he cut out her tongue and tossed it on my lap. I was choking back sobs back by then. Next he dug the knife between each of Sue's fingernails. The first one came off clean, and the second one was just as swift. When it came to the third one, he slowly inserted the blade and twisted it. Finally, he took the knife and stabbed Sue in the stomach, giving the blade one final twist. Sue moaned one last time before succumbing to her injuries. Then Peter turned around and said, Don't worry, you'll never grow up. But he didn't kill me. I'm still here. And I watched Peter Pan do the same thing that he did to my sister to other kids. Every night. I used to try to warn them, but he taught me that it was wrong to question him. Peter Pan taught me a lot of things. I still have at least a few years until he kills me. If I'm lucky, I'll persuade him into doing it further. I love you, Sue. And I'm sorry. When I was 13 years old, I touched a Ouija board. I should have never touched it because Ouija boards are bad news. And every time I've ever been told in my life to not touch a Ouija board, it was by an older and wiser witch. But I was 13 years old <laughs> and I thought I knew better. And I was dabbling with things I probably should have dabbled with. And me and my friends, who at the time were my influence, told me this is to be okay. But it's not a big deal. It's just a toy. Okay, so I put my fingers on the planchette as it goes across the board, and then it starts spelling things, things that no one else knows in that room, and I was not touching that planchette very hard, but it kept moving, and it kept telling people about all the things that I was hiding at that time, why I had bruises on my face why I was angry and hated everyone. It knew me. It knew me as if it was a friend or maybe a relative. And then I realized as it was talking to me who this person was, who this person, knowing all these little things about me, knowing that I was starting to get scared, and my friends were starting to get weirded out. Queenie, are you doing this? Said one of my friends. No. Why would I do that? This is silly and stupid. And she just looked at me, <laughs> smiled, and said, Well, now we know who you are. And I looked at the board and said, God damn it, Grandma. Go away. That's so okay. she would say things that only me and her could know. And... I eventually picked up on it, but it took me a while because I was freaking out and <laughs> this was happening and it seemed very real. But then like later on that night, I would sit in bed telling myself that it just, <laughs> that couldn't be real. That's not possible. The end. <laughs> um, there was one time. Um, and I'm talking, it sounds silly when I talk about it, I guess, because nothing actually happened. Uh, but, um, I'll try to make this as short as I can. Oh, no. I was staying oh. with my mom. Okay. Uh, I stayed with my mom for a while in 1987. <laughs> oh God, I shouldn't date myself like that. But anyway, <laughs> um, 
as in my early 20s. Um, <clears throat> anyway, I was staying with her for a while. And uh, I was not, uh, she lived out of town. So I wasn't that familiar with her house. You know, and that's a long story that I won't get into. Uh, but uh, she told me that her uh, washer and dryer were in the basement. And I had some clothes I wanted to wash one day I was there and I go down to the basement and I couldn't find the washer and dryer at first. Of course, they were like, you know, as soon as you walk down there, they were like to the left or whatever. But I was looking further into the basement and it was a huge basement. I mean, it, it must have, exp- you know, like the whole expanse of the house or something. I mean, it was huge. I just seem to remember it being huge. Like it was uh, like there was another room to it and everything. Um, but anyway, uh, I look in, I'm like looking, looking, looking for the wash and dryer. And then I look into this like small room. It was almost like a closet, except it didn't have a door. Um, it had an old Christmas tree in there, you know, like somebody put it in there for storage. Uh, it had an old chair in there. Anyway, I'm like kind of poking my head into that room and I didn't see anything. I didn't hear anything, but I had all of a sudden the most choking fear that that I, I've ever had for no reason. You know, I mean, it's like I've had fear like that, but for a reason. <laughs> I mean, this was like nothing had happened, but I was suddenly scared to death and I took off running up those stairs. I, I didn't even uh, I. I I didn't even <laughs> I didn't even do the laundry that day. I don't think <laughs> I don't really remember, but I didn't go back down there by myself. That's for sure. Uh, but what makes that story interesting is when I told my mom about it later, she told me a few things <laughs> like how my sister, when she had lived there, like <laughs> one day she heard uh, footsteps walking around down in the basement and uh, since our stepdad, you know, uh, spent a lot of time down there, she just assumed that was him. Uh, then she happens to look up a- at the window and the stepdad's pulling into the, the driveway. <laughs> <laughs> so there was nobody down there when she heard these footsteps, right? And anyway, there was some other stuff. So, oh, and then my mother told me later that, uh, that chair that was in that room, an uncle of hers died in it. So, you know, it's like there, there was something I felt there and it was, it was, I've never felt it before. I never felt it since. And I'm not what you'd call sensitive to those sort of things. I wouldn't say, or I might've felt it, you know, some other time, but there must've been something strong there and it did not want me there. (laughs) That's what I'm thinking. It was like, who the hell are you? (laughs) You know, so yeah, that's really my only thing. So ever since a couple of years ago, um, I've noticed some weird things going on with my balcony in my apartment. And I mean, this, this has been a few years. At first I would hear like footsteps, like somebody was pacing back and forth across the balcony. And, at fr- and I'm on the second floor, mind you. So it's not like somebody hopped the fence and, is just walking around back there. And that creeped me out really bad. But I was too afraid to look at first. So I think a few months go by, and it still happens periodically only at night, where it would just sound like somebody's walking back and forth across my balcony. And I talk myself into actually seeing what's going on. But the second I would stand up, it would stop. I mean, immediately stop. But I would still walk over psych myself up into opening the door because I was scared (laughs) open the door and there would be nothing and I would look everywhere I would check the neighbor's balcony in case maybe I'm hearing the neighbor nope nothing I'd look down into the yard did somebody jump down nope would have heard it don't see anybody so eventually the footsteps do stop but recently it's changed into how do I explain it this, this always came accompanied with a feeling of being watched, and I thought I was imagining it, and I probably w- am imagining it, but the door sometimes just opens just a crack, even though it's shut, and then I have to go close the door. 
after checking that nobody's there. <laughs> and I have these big giant windows next to the same door, and they're covered in curtains. And sometimes the curtains also open slightly. But like somebody had just like pulled it slightly open. And then I have to cover it again. Because I have this fear that I'm gonna look over and I'm gonna see something looking at me. And I and I mean something and not someone, because that's how it feels. And then even recently I'll see like weird shadows on the curtains that it could be trees. It's probably trees, but it doesn't look like trees. And then if I go look, there's nothing there. And my cat freaks out whenever this stuff happens. And I think it's unusual to have a cat freak out. I mean, dogs bark <clears throat> and stuff. But I mean, a cat, um, there was one night last week, I think, where the door just suddenly burst open. And then my cat, Gypsy, just ran outside the door. Hmm. And when I went to chase him, because I was so scared, oh, no, don't don't eat my cat, <laughs> whatever this is, even though it might be just the wind, like, I'm like battling my rational mind and my weird fear I have of the balcony. And I go out there and check, and Gypsy acts very distressed, and he meows, and he looks scared, and I look around, and I can't find anything. And this has been happening for years. But, I mean, nothing that hasn't... That nothing I couldn't explain happens. It's just all together, all these little things, and the fact that it's always the balcony and the weird feeling I get. <clears throat> like I could be in the middle of watching a movie and be engrossed in it, and suddenly that feeling comes. So I'm honestly not sure hmm. if I'm imagining it, if I'm not imagining it. I am sure there's an explanation. I just don't know what it is, and it creeps me out really bad. <laughs> if it was, If there were other things that happened and not just the balcony, I might... Be like, oh, okay, you're imagining it, like hypervigilance, corner of your eye shadow type thing. Yeah. But it'll come out of nowhere. All right, so uh, I live in New Orleans and uh, Louisiana, and this is one of the most plotted places in the United States. Uh, I mean, it's crazy how uh, many experiences that people have here on a daily basis. And I, uh, you know, I didn't believe... And a lot of I was very I was mo very much a skeptic, um, you know. I I would believe maybe one eighteenth of the stories that I would hear. And uh, one day we had some family come down, and they decided to uh, go on one of those tours that they have down here. Um, and basically, you go around to all of the, the cemeteries, like St. Louis Cemetery Number One and Two, and uh, that's actually where Nicholas Cage has his. Uh, his tombstone ready to go for when he dies is in St. Louis Cemetery number one. And yeah, it's crazy. And we, you know, we were just going around uh, doing all this stuff. And the third cemetery that we went to, uh, it was one of the oldest Jewish cemeteries in the area. And it was closed when we got there. Uh, but they were, you know, telling the story about it and it was getting dark. And we were all on the trolley and we got off as they were talking. And I had just gotten this new digital camera, and I was really excited about taking pictures of all the tombstones and things like that, because uh, I love the old tombstones; they're great. And so I, we couldn't go into this the cemetery, unfortunately. But as they were talking, everybody started to get back on the trolley, and for some reason, I don't even know why I did this, but I ran around the side because they had these really high concrete walls. And I couldn't see anything, but I took my camera and I put it over the concrete gate that was there. I couldn't see anything. I just took one shot over the gate and I pulled it down and I'm like, maybe I got a good shot. Maybe I didn't, didn't know. When we got on the trolley and I started to go through the pictures and I got to that picture mm -hmm. and I almost dropped my camera because there was, you could see the tombstones there, and there's this huge blue neon streak going through it. Mm. And I was like, what is this? Like, I, I, I couldn't, I, I thought maybe it was a malfunction with the camera. Mm -hmm. And I tried taking a few more pictures, and it was not coming up in any other pictures. And it's just this crazy picture with this big violet blue streak going through it. And I showed everybody on the trolley, and the tour guide, she said, can you please email this to me? 
uh, would like to put it on our website. I was like, sure. You know, I wasn't sure if it was anything paranormal, but I was like, this is really cool. Maybe it is. So we got home after all this happened. And I, unfortunately, I was by myself that night at home. And this is where the really scary part comes in because I, I, I cannot explain this to this day. And it's, okay. So I was in my room and I got really tired and I started to go to sleep. And, and I'm telling you this for a reason because I had back then, I had a slider phone. I don't know if anybody remembers <laughs> slider phones. Yeah. It was back when the slider phones were out. And to take a video on a slider phone, there's a lot of stuff you have to do to take a video on a slider phone. And I mean, from going to the option to naming it after you took it, to, I mean, there's a lot of steps. And I'm telling you this for a reason. So I fell asleep and uh, I don't know how long I was asleep for, but I woke up because the TV was very loud. And I, it was not loud when I fell asleep. It was very, very loud. And I looked around for the remote. I was very dizzy. I didn't know why I felt so weak, so dizzy. I was just, what's going on? And the TV's blaring at me. I can't buy my cat. My cat's nowhere to be found. I'm alone in the house. And I'm looking for the remote. And the remote's nowhere. And I get up. I turn the TV off manually. And I go looking for my cat. And uh, she's in the closet. But the closet door is closed. And I don't know how that happened. And I was like, well, how the heck did you get in here? And when I opened the door, she came flying out. And she, her tail was puffy. And she was very agitated. And I found my remote all the way across the room on the floor. Now, I, I didn't throw that remote over there, obviously. So I wasn't drunk. I wasn't, you know, nothing was wrong with me. I wasn't going to throw the remote over there. So I don't know how that happened either. And I'm just, at this point, I'm still thinking everything's fine. You know, this is just it's a little weird, but it's okay. So I had to go to the bathroom. So I went to the bathroom, and as I'm sitting there doing what I got to do, my phone goes off. I hear my phone go off, and it's right next to me on a pile of magazines. And I did not leave that there, okay? Didn't leave that there. That was It was on the charger when I fell asleep. How it got two rooms away in the bathroom, I will never know. And remember, I'm, I'm alone in the house. Everything's locked up. I'm, And the phone goes off, and it's like 3 o'clock in the morning. And I look at the phone, and... I had a missed call from my dad, and I said, okay, I'll call him back in a minute. So I'm still very drowsy and dizzy at this point. I go back into the room. My cat's still freaking out. I sit down on the bed, and right as I go to call my dad back, when I slid the phone up to turn it back on, it went to my gallery. And I noticed in my gallery, there was three files in my gallery, and they were all like they were pitch black, like there wasn't anything in the thumbnail. I'm like, what is this? And they were each named, one of them was 0999, 0991, and 09993. And I'll, I'll forever remember the names of these files because when I clicked on the first one, um, I couldn't hear any, I couldn't see anything, but I was seeing like flashes of light in there. And uh, I could hear like the mumbling of my TV in the background and all of a sudden I hear whimpering and I'm like what's happening and I'm like you know holding it up to my face trying to see I'm holding it up to my ear to try and hear what's going on in these files and I realize that it's me in these files I'm I'm whimpering I'm asleep and I'm whimpering and crying and I'm like crying out for my dad and I'm like, please don't hurt my dad. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm very scared in these files. I'm shaking right now telling this because it's just, it's terrifying to see yourself uh, like that. Uh, and you know for a fact that you didn't take those pictures. You didn't take this video. And you don't know who did. Uh, and I'm just very upset. And the way... It, the camera wasn't zooming into my face. It was like someone was standing above me on the bed, mm. like above my face. And they were like putting the phone in my face, not zooming. They were like moving the camera back and forth, mm -hmm. like on my face and then back, on my face and back. 
and it was it was like they were right above me and I had a king size bed at the time I was right in the middle of the bed so I don't know how anyone could if it was an actual person that did this I mean they would have to have you know stretch arm strong arms like I mean honestly it was it was the craziest experience I've ever had and that was the first video second video was the same thing except that I was getting more and more upset I was like having a really horrible dream and it was terrifying I was like what is happening and the third one was the same thing I still have these videos on my phone all these phones later I could continually save them on my phone because you know I I, I try and tell people the story I'm like you can see it right here like it's right here you can look <laughs> and I I, I, to this day, I still do not know who or what took these videos. I don't know why I was so upset while I was asleep. I don't know how my cat got into that closet and the closet was closed. I don't know how my phone got into the bathroom. And this was the night of that uh, tour of where I took that photo over the wall with the, with the blue streak in it. Right. So. I don't know if I angered something from getting a shot of it over the fence. I don't know. I mean, ever since then, we've had little paranormal experiences happen in this house. I mean, I was by myself. It, it was one of the most scary experiences, the most unexplained things that's ever happened to me. And to this day, I still don't know how to explain it. My father calls me Miranda, but I'm not sure if that's entirely true. But you can just call me that too, I guess. The only thing I know for sure is that three weeks ago, I died. And two weeks ago, I came back in my father's basement. It was dark. I was cold. I couldn't move my right arm or leg. I tried to get up off the table I was laying on, but I ended up just face planting on the floor. Despite the feeling of blood trickling from my nose, it didn't hurt. A gentle hand rested on my back, and I looked up to see an old man with thinning white hair and silver glasses. He looked like your typical grandpa. It looks like you were a success. I'll call you Miranda. I looked down to see how my right arm was stitched onto my torso, how the light brown skin of my calf didn't match my pale thigh. I spent a lot of time examining myself. I believe that externally, I'm made of three different people. I believe all of them were women. Internally is an entirely different matter. I cannot confirm either way. I'm an amalgamation of many different people, and it shows. For example, I'm quite sure I died in a car accident. I was driving home with friends. I made a bad joke. We all laughed. A deer stepped in front of the car, and I swerved to avoid it. I remember crunching metal, how my friends screamed, and then nothing. But I'm also certain I was shot. I get flashes of feeling the muzzle of the gun pressed against my chest, how I sobbed and begged for mercy. I may have also committed suicide by hanging, or leukemia that plagued me my entire life finally finishing me off. I may have died a virgin, or had a son. Maybe I struggled with my school the whole life because of dyslexia and ADHD, or I was about to graduate at the top of my class at an elite college. Maybe I was out hiking every weekend, or I lived for rainy days so I could curl up on my couch with a laptop and a cat. Maybe I was allergic to cats. I don't know. Maybe it's all of the above. All the experiences of people I was before turning into one singular being. My father's name is Albert, but I'm not his first experiment. But I'm the most successful. I'm still relearning how to talk, but I can type and have an average intelligence. That's more than I can say for Michelle and Nathaniel. They're the other two successes of my father, but they're not nearly as advanced as I am. Nathaniel acts like a little boy, despite looking to be in his mid-thirties. He loves the color red, and he thinks it's so funny to pop out his brown eye and hide it someplace for me to find. 
when I do find it, I always jump out of my skin. And since my legs are different lengths, I tend to tumble to the ground. Then he comes around the corner, giggling as he puts his eye back in. Poor Michelle is constantly afraid. Michelle looks like a seven-year-old girl and is constantly on high alert. If she doesn't want anyone to find her, no one will. But she obeys her father and always stays in the house. But given her petite size and the fact that she can bend any which way she wants, she can hide quite literally anywhere for hours, even days before she comes out. I'm not sure if our father loves us or he's fascinated by us, but he can be very strict. We're not allowed to leave the house. I tried to go for a walk and ended up getting locked in a closet for three days. Nathaniel was nice enough to bring me a hamburger and fries on my second day there. We don't really need to eat, but it feels good to have a full stomach. We're also not allowed to ask how Father made us. He says he's still working on correcting the process, and he'd rather not share until he knows it's complete. He did tell us that he did bring us back from the dead, and for that we should be eternally grateful. I'm not sure that I am, but I'm not sure of anything nowadays. I want to go home. But I'm not sure where home is. Is it in a big city where I took the subway every day to work? Or is it the small town where we always got snowed in every winter? I can't be certain. There's also the fact that I may just fall apart if I run away. Although Father does his best, he's not very good at sewing. Nathaniel is far better at it than him. But if he catches us... He tends to start screaming about messing with his design. That's another thing. He doesn't want anyone to change what he's made. Since we are his children and we should be grateful to him, we are to do exactly what he says and not change how he made us. Even though Nathaniel struggles to figure out how to tie his shoes, Michelle can't go a night without having a screaming nightmare. Mm -hmm. And the stitches on my gut are constantly coming undone. He refuses to see how we could be improved. He only prepares for the next experiment. Deciding that next time he'll be the one to get it right. I suppose that's why I'm here. Whether I'm Miranda or Andrea or Lucy or Maria, I'm here. I'm here for a reason. And that reason is to fix his mistakes. Thankfully, he's one of those old people who believe one, two, three, four is a successful password, allowing me access to his computer to do research. Michelle helps me find his notes while he's sleeping at night. I study. Nathaniel makes sure I have plenty of hot drinks to keep my belly warm. He's already almost a quarter ways done with his next child, but I've been watching. This one will not be any better than us. Once again, he'll bring somebody back in this half-dead, half-alive state. Caught in miserable paranoia or worse, but I'll be fixing him. Once I figure out how Father keeps screwing us up, I'll fix everything. And if he objects, well, he's going to learn quite quickly that he's outnumbered three to one. So close, this raven. <laughs>